to the infodemic pandemic is summit 2021. So first session for the day would be understanding misinformation, disinformation, and information. The session would be moderated by Mr. Rajiv Tikku, senior journalist and editor. Mr. Tikku is a New Delhi-based development communication professional of more than two decades with proven track record in senior management position in reputed regional, national, and international organizations like One Word Group, United Nations Millennial Campaign, the Indian Express Group, and India Today Group. His academic background is in social and sustainable development. As a speaker, we are joined by Dr. Sanjay K. Rai, Professor, Department of Community Medicine, AIMS, New Delhi. He is also president of IPHA. Dr. Rai, is a member of many technical expert groups constituted by Government of India, Indian Council of Medical Research, International Clinic Epidemiology Network, and Public Health Foundation of India. He has contributed in many national health programs, including National AIDS Control Program, National Rural Health Mission, Revised National Tuberculosis Control Program, National Vector Borne Disease Control Program, and National Urban Health Mission. He will be joined by Dr. Rajiv Das Gupta, Chairperson, Center of Social Medicine and Community Health, JNU, New Delhi. Specialization lies in epidemiology, nutrition, child health, urban health, non-communicable disease. He has published various books and journals and has played leading roles in GNU, John Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health, Baltimore, and NCD. Then we have with us Dr. Amitabh Banerjee, Professor and Head of Communication at Dr. D.Y. Patil Medical College, Pune. In his previous roles, he has also served as medical officer epidemiologist at Indian Armed Forces and associate professor community medicine at Armed Forces Medical College, Pune. Over to you, Mr. Rajiv. Uh, thank you, Dr. <coughs> Sodeep, uh, for uh, giving the larger picture and where we come from and where we are headed to. And the video was excellent in summing up the whole thing. Thank you very much. And uh, since uh, lots of introduction has already gone into it, so I'll straight, straight away not take much time and uh, take the advantage of eminent panelists' uh, knowledge to uh, guide us uh, through the session. The session, as we understand, uh, the title of the session is Understanding Misinformation, Disinformation, Malinformation. Uh, while Dr. Shivasa said that probably we're slightly digressing, but I would uh, beg to differ with him that the mere fact that the title of the uh, seminar is infodemic pandemic. We're bang on right now considering the situation that we're facing right now. The infodemic, as we know, is compromising public health response in some cases seeking to promote vested interests. So we'll get into days later on. Even WHO has said infodemic man management is key to fight, fight, fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. So that, that overall emphasizes the uh, the, uh, the criticality of managing infodemic in these pandemic times because uh, uh, it's, it's only feeding the pandemic further. So without much ado, I'll, 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 I'll turn over to our eminent panelist, Dr. Sanjay K. Rai, uh, to help us understand what has been the experience of some of the common examples. Dr. Sivasu gave some of the examples in the video, but I would like to hear from the uh, from the person in the field, actually, who uh, what has been said your experience? Uh, what are the typical examples we, you have come across? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> And thank you, TPG, and uh, Namaskar, all the panelists, dignities from media, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Pando is there, and all my colleagues are there. So, <clears throat> and I also, um, I must congratulate uh, organizers, especially um, Dr. Sudeep Sirvasto, for selecting a very relevant uh, topic in current scenario. And um, this is pandemic of information or um, bombardment of information, I can say. <laughs> Yeah, so, <clears throat> so this addressing uh, mis misinformation, disinformation, almost these are the synonym word. Uh, uh, we all know uh, this uh, SARS coronavirus, which was originated almost one and a half years ago. Uh, um, I'm using this term originated. We don't have any evidence that it's not originated from uh, and, and one. So that's why I'm intentionally I'm using this word originated and not reported. Like many times we see, so um, uh, this is also a misinformation that um, that was not originated from one. <clears throat> so um, whatever evidence we have, um, uh, we can say that most probably originated from um, um, this uh, one city of the China. This virus uh, called SARS coronavirus two almost one and a half year ago and causing this um, COVID nineteen uh, problem. So entire world is crippling more than 
18 crore, um, almost one eight, more than 118 million um, uh, reported cases throughout the world. <clears throat> uh, and in, uh, is, is still in few part of the world, it's, um, uh, it's um, uh, growing at an uh, exponential rate. And uh, since last one and a half year, we are, either we are receiving some information or we are providing some information to other um, uh, and some information provided by us also may be con constituted as um, misinformation. <clears throat> uh, although we, uh, we, are, we are trying to provide the correct information, but uh, in any way uh, that could be constituted uh, as misinformation. And <clears throat> this is happening since the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, um, and so, uh, either social media, electronic media, print media, all are full with this type of information, misinformation, you can say inaccurate information. And this inaccurate information really um, spread very widely, um, COVID, especially COVID-19 related information. <clears throat> so the few information, as you asked, like um, um, wearing gloves and um, can help protect us from COVID infection. Is it right information? Or wrong information we can discuss, uh, but if everybody everywhere they are wearing gloves. In epidemiology, we te uh, we teach when to wear glove. Uh, uh, sometimes this type of misinformation actually this is not preventing your uh, COVID nineteen spread. It's helping spreading spread <coughs> COVID nineteen. How it's help? Uh, suppose if you are not wearing gloves, um, uh, then you will wash your hand at a regular interval. Mm -hmm. After wearing gloves, uh, suppose if you, um, you are touching a contaminated surface, like then you will touch your phone also, you are contaminating phone. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so this type of or any other <coughs> surface you are touching. Um, uh, so th this type of um, misinformation that wearing gloves is helpful in transmitting, <coughs> uh, preventing transmission actually that propagate transmission. So there are a lot of, um, um, like um, um, can drinking alcohol um, um, uh, help prevent COVID-19? Um, this is also a very common uh, question. <coughs> uh, um, like um, uh, can ultraviolet, um, there are uh, ultraviolet bulb uh, used for disinfecting, be used to kill COVID-19 on our body. Um, um, uh, there are many others like, um, is harmful. This is also um, in, 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 there are uh, some it's, um, like misinformation that vaccination after natural infection make as a booster. This is completely we'll discuss um, why uh, these yeah. are yeah, yeah. And, and natural infection is not providing better uh, protection. So all these are really misinformation and at a large scale getting in this community. Yeah. So these are the few yeah. examples. Yeah, Dr. Sanjay, thank you very much for uh, highlighting some basics which uh, common people don't understand uh, in good faith, actually. Wearing gloves, we always think that is going to be is safe. So uh, I'll, I'll move on to our uh, next uh, eminent panelist, Dr. Rajiv Dasgupta. Sir, what has been your experience in terms of uh, uh, facing such kind of uh, infodemic? Uh, as, as Dr. Rai said, that they are almost synonymous. So I won't go into every time uh, differentiating between each uh, one and the other. But let's just call this infodemic for practical purposes right now. So, sir, what has been your example? experience. Dr. Rajiv Das Gupta. Thank you. Sorry, it wasn't mute. Thank you very much. Uh, it is true that at times it's difficult to make this distinction. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, the COVID-19 pandemic, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, infodemic was actually described as an overabundance of information. Amazing some accurate and some not, that mm -hmm. makes it hard for people to find mm -hmm. trustworthy sources mm -hmm. and reliable guidance when they need mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that really is the operational uh, definition in which we operate. And uh, interestingly, the World Economic Forum cautioned these, these as what it called digital fires. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, digital wildfires. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think what's very interesting, one of the interesting aspects, there are many, uh, some Dr. Rai has already alluded to, uh, the 
COVID rumor waves actually started as early as the third week of January. Mm -hmm. And one, uh, one very extensive review uh, across 87 countries and 25 languages mm -hmm. identified three waves of the COVID rumor. Uh, the first lasting from January 21 to February 13, 2020. Mm -hmm. And then the second from February 14th to March 7th, and the third from mm -hmm. March 8th to March 31st. Mm -hmm. So very interestingly, in India, uh, barring one or two imported cases from the Wuhan returnees, mm -hmm. the first cases actually started towards the end of March. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Indian poultry sector uh, started getting affected even from the first wave of rumors and certainly by the second wave of rumors in February, uh, m through most of February, when actually there were neither any COVID cases in India and actually very little that, has, that had come out of the government of India information sources for the simple reason we were in preparatory phases and also relatively less was known even globally, mm -hmm. barring a few countries. Mm -hmm. So uh, the point I'm uh, trying to illustrate is that something as remote as the poultry sector, the, mm -hmm. the, the rumor was that uh, COVID could affect uh, mm -hmm. hens and chickens and eggs and therefore mm -hmm. prices actually dramatically fell for, through February and March. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, it can be as diverse as that and as apparently right. remote as that. Right. Uh, Thank you. We can pick up other issues as we go along. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for pointing out this uh, business issue, which has been, of course, affecting livelihoods and populations in the country and uh, at times without reason, of course. Uh, thank you. I'll move on to uh, our next uh, eminent panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Amita Banerjee. Sir, what has been your common experience in dealing with this such kind of information? Uh, I have been, uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Tekku, and thank you, Heer Foundation. Uh, I have been following this uh, pandemic as everyone has been following, and I think the initial cues uh, come from the authoritative sources. I mean, uh, not always deliberately. I would say that misinformation may be act of omission, but mm -hmm. misinformation may be act of commission, and malinformation may be some uh, malified vested interest. So right. these, I would just go by that way. Mm -hmm. uh, what has happened is uh, from the beginning, uh, it started in China and as uh, Dr. Raj uh, also brought out that uh, initially uh, there was a lot of rumors. In fact, we have seen on WhatsApp that uh, people falling on the roads and all that uh, due to just collapsing. So these were the initial fear. And uh, this was uh, amplified by certain uh, misinformation, say like those uh, Neil Ferguson models. I mean, that one can say by including the inputs which were inaccurate, the high lethality and then the lockdown. So naturally it created the public panic. So I would call that misinformation. Then subsequently there was uh, this uh, about the hydroxychloroquine that started uh, and uh, the Lancet uh, published an article of hydroxychloroquine which was found to be on fake data, which had to be tracked later. So that was a deliberate, uh, I would say, disinformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, one thing. And uh, other thing, of course, uh, the dose of hydroxychloroquine used in the trial in a uh, journal as uh, eminent as Lancet. If uh, nobody is questioned, the ethical committee did not question the hydroxychloroquine dose was used, the double the recommended dose, mm -hmm. to just to precipitate cardiac toxicity. So it was mm -hmm. a, I mean, I think there was some uh, mal 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 information or some malified mm -hmm. intentions mm -hmm. to at least, uh, and then the same uh, controversy is going on ivermectin. So that mm -hmm. is well known. The mm -hmm. WHO scientist tweeted on ivermectin, then she removed the tweet when a notice was served to her. So this type of things, what happens, the public mm -hmm. loses trust. And in this vacuum, it gives, uh, I mean, there is no transparency and risk communication. Mm -hmm. Another very recent, very interesting thing I was just seeing, I would quote it exactly because this is very important. May 26, 221 New York Times reported that the CDC misinterpreted a scientific paper which brought out that uh, misinterpretation was that the risk of outdoor transmission is 10 percent and mm -hmm. it gave guidelines that uh, don't step outdoor and even we now also we are having callers tools that uh, even India because whatever the CDC said the global it's uh, everybody follows those instructions so when the author of that paper interestingly said that this was a misinterpretation by CDC the actual risk is only 0.1 percent outdoor and uh, mm -hmm. 
The CDC still has not corrected its here and it has given guidelines that outdoor is risky, wear mask outdoors, whereas the transmission is taking place indoors. And because of that, all the businesses are closed. So many people, small, small traders suffered who could have done business outdoors. So see, you see, these are some of the year which is causes more harm when this, uh, and then, then there is polarization. You see, great science comes when there are great uh, disagreements. There is debate. What is happening is that any alternative or any questioning of the mainstream guideline is being censored or even today I was seeing a Wikipedia, the founder said that he, he has stopped seeing the Wikipedia because the Wikipedia also news cannot be trusted. Today only I was seeing a, 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 a that, uh, that so this is, I mean, uh, what we require is an open debate rather than censorship, rather than selective. Yeah. So we require, and some of the Nobel Prize winners also have been censored. So that's very unfortunate for science. Dr. Benji, thank you very much for pointing out two important aspects here. One is about the uh, uh, acts of omission or commission by authorities, government authorities, as well as by scientific community. So there uh, uh, will come to the, the, the kind of uh, confusion those things have uh, created subsequently in one, one another question. But right now, what, what I understand is, of course, we, we covered uh, that uh, we, there, there, there's an issue about basic information, uh, misinterpretation of basic information, misunderstanding of that, even industry effects. And finally, of course, as you talked about, the authorities and uh, also scientific community misreporting or getting misreported on various issues which is affecting us and in turn causing confusion. We'll come to that a bit later in the, uh, uh, but uh, right now I, I would I would say that uh, we also seen globally, it's not a, uh, 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 also, it's not exclusive to India also. We've seen globally conspiracy theories about artificial creation of co coronavirus, which is yet to be proved of course. And even rumors in India about vaccine causing, for example, infertility, we've seen those unfortunate uh, examples also. So uh, having said that, of course, we need to address those issues. But, uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Wright uh, to begin with, how is not it, it, uh, this uh, infodemic really affecting our fight against COVID-19 pandemic? How much uh, do you think is it really uh, compromising our efforts? If I recall correctly, our time location is total 35 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's already 27 minutes have passed. So we have eight minutes only. So I shall be very brief. Okay, sir. right. That's a very nice way to point it, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, in, actually, in public health, as a thumb rule, you propagate minimum masses with maximum impact. If uh, you are propagating a lot of masses, then the high impact masses, you will miss the high impact masses. So, overall impact will be less. Uh, so, this is as a thumb rule. So, if you have too much information, it's really very difficult to identify and follow the correct information uh, like um, and, uh, for any uh, one example i am giving um, uh, misinformation that no um, vaccination uh, natural infection um, is not providing the better uh, protection um, uh, vaccination up and after natural infection will provide a better protection and see if you, you are not following this uh, then you can save millions of life. Currently, it's a very precious item or commodity vaccine. Um, right. If don't waste unnecessarily, um, if they do not require, then we have sufficient evidence that mm -hmm. those who had natural infection, they are well protected. So don't waste it. So these are the ex examples. So mm -hmm. there should be a minimum message with maximum impact. Thank you. Thank you very much for this pertinent kind of uh, messaging. Uh, Dr. Rajiv, uh, now what can be done by who all to reduce the impact in an emergency situation like right now? Because we all seem to be uh, really uh, at a loss actually how to manage things. Dr. Rajiv. I'm sorry, I missed yeah. the audio. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you repeat I, I just, it, please? Uh, sir, uh, given the uh, given the context which Dr. Sanjay Rai gave, now what would you suggest, what can be done by who all to reduce the impact of infodemic on the pandemic? Okay, okay. Now, essentially, uh, the way uh, this, is, this is organized in the country uh, is that at the central level, this is, there, there, there is a, there is a, um, there's a media war room Mm -hmm. which uh, which takes on uh, these issues uh, almost real time or as real time as mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. There is a collaboration between the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, the mm -hmm. UNICEF, its various mm -hmm. communication partners, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and a larger group, uh, in, I mean, in, in, including me. 
uh, we we engage very closely with uh, with media we engage very closely with what's uh, coming in and and therefore uh, there is there there's a as as real time as possible and as dynamic a possible response uh, to 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 handle this to negotiate with this at the same time what's what's very critical to underscore is that in contrast to previous um uh, previous uh, campaigns such as say polio or even measles rubella mm -hmm. uh, elimination more recently there is relatively little presence on the field uh, because of the covid situation mm -hmm. and and that's not really uh, helping or 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 we can't really leverage mm -hmm. uh, those those interpersonal i mean interpersonal communication as a mode uh, to the extent that we ought to uh, and 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 that's been a constraint and and therefore most of it has been mm -hmm. over electronic platforms of right. various kind right. thank you yeah, yeah. thank you dr das gupta you pointed out to polio here and that takes me back to dr amita uh, benaji what has been our learning from we face similar kind of situation on a smaller scale at the time of polio vaccination also has there been any learning any lessons which we can adopt now uh learning of course polio was a very very evolved uh, vaccination because when we went, we are going for eradication more and there was certain uh, resistance on some pockets so they involved some religious teachers and community leaders so that is the way forward actually whenever there are certain uh, if it uh, i mean uh, if we go for that i mean uh, i think it's too early to you know as it is we don't have adequate vaccines so i think uh, once we go for the end game that may be required because polio you are comparing the end game here we are in the beginning that's a very important point you pointed out so uh, we had to learn our lessons here only so coming back to dr sanjay rai dr rai yeah 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 okay sir sir or uh, as as has been pointed out by you and other eminent speakers also our understanding of the corona virus and its behavior is still a work in progress guidelines are getting revised constantly there is also difference in uh, guidelines between who and government indian government guidelines at times whether it is about uh, hydrochloroquine or it's about ivermectin also and state governments also seem to be having different kind of protocols in place now what would you advise healthcare professionals or even common citizens who do googling all the time to do in this situation uh, uh, the first and most important advice for me is to involve the domain experts mm -hmm. like community medicine or public health specialist <clears throat> um, um, already we have lot of public health specialist all over country so the first and most important um, involve this community medicine specialist or do domain experts for this type of infectious disease and 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 it's our moral and social responsibility to educate the community and poorly informed healthcare providers many healthcare providers are really poorly informed and it's our moral responsibility and not only moral it's a social responsibility to inform them so <clears throat> i will suggest government of india we have already suggested to mm -hmm. involve the, really the domain experts and mm -hmm. if you have a um, cardiac problem definitely you will involve cardiologist you, you can ask with any but uh, main decision maker should be a cardiologist for a cardiac problem so same in the same way for a public health problem the public health mm -hmm. specialist should be given priority thank you thank you very much sir so uh, 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 dr rajiv das gupta uh, going forward the government the union agencies the media houses tech companies also which are part of the problem unfortunately they are trying their best to do something or the other but somehow uh, it's just sort of adding up as of now is there a reason for that or do you see a gap there for example uh, involvement of public health professionals there well it's it's been a very complex situation and uh, broadly three or four things uh, have have been intertwined one is organizing health services arranging for treatment second is prevention as a whole third a whole range of uh, disaster mitigation efforts and fourth is vaccination uh, just to give an example even from the vaccination domain uh, there is something called aefi adverse events following immunization which is a very key concern particularly given that it's a new vaccine so even within the vaccination program the aefi is seemingly taking a back seat uh because the major concern and the major excitement and the and, and all energy is consumed into 
arranging vaccine logistics, organizing mm -hmm. sessions, immunizing, reporting mm -hmm. numbers, and so on and so forth. So, so the, the point I'm making is that a multitude of activities is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the core human resource that we have is actually limited. It is limited. Let's recognize is that it's limited. Mm -hmm. and, and, and everyone is, is caught in multiple activities, particularly when you go down to the district level. Uh, things things seem, uh, I, I mean, you get one view from the national level mm -hmm. and, and when you actually go to the front lines of the district uh, level or what's what's in, uh, in in governance jargon is known as street level implementers, that the view at the street level is quite different and it's it's a completely different challenge from what we see and, and realize here. And therefore, uh, I, I, I believe Extraordinary, extraordinary and Herculean efforts have been made by street level implementers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is an evolving situation and we have been learning, all of us have been learning, both mm -hmm. the science as well as mm -hmm. the practice. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Das Gupta. Uh, Dr. Banerjee, uh, since public health professionals have been involved, of course, but they don't seem to be the key players here. Uh, would you be also in favor of uh, really uh, for them to take a lead here or uh, be authorized to take a lead from the government side also? They have been involved, of course, but probably they're not the most prominent ones. Definitely, because the uh, main activity once you're uh, rolling it out in the community would be your uh, surveillance and epidemiological surveillance right up to the remote areas. Mm -hmm. So here we require the people in the public health professionals right up to the even paramedics and grassroots level right up mm -hmm. to the center mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And this is what has been lacking here also because now uh, there's a lot of incoordination uh, that way. And as uh, Dr. Rajiv brought out, if there are any adverse events, we want to roll out vaccination door to door. So these adverse events require a good public health reporting system of adverse events and uh, other surveillance and even the clusters. And whether we require it or not, like now uh, the recent survey in some parts, 80% of the people are having the zero positivity IgGs. So now we can use the public health professionals to really map those areas uh, on high vaccine and save the vaccine. So that would be more efficient rather than duplicating the nature's efforts if 80% or 70% people are already immune for some time from natural infection. So a public health mapping would be very important. Sir, you also talked about the crisis management in a way that in case there's any adverse incident, yeah, yeah. the ministry has already, has already a document in place a vaccine strategy which goes into minute detail right from the central government to district level or block level. But we don't see that crisis management groups being really activated. We don't see that common protocol in communication really being implemented. Now, uh, do you also see a gap between what, what's on paper and what is implemented finally? Exactly. Dr. Rajiv Dasgupta brought it out. We don't have that resources at that scale to monitor these. And in fact, uh, up till now, even as per the official record, there has been only one death from adverse events, but people have got anecdotal evidence of uh, no deaths. So that uh, again causes the loss of public uh, trust and uh, rumor mongering and infodemics and all that. If we are not transparent with the data, if our system is not placed, any coincident death also can give a bad publicity to the vaccine. So this, for that, we require a very robust system first, then we start the year. We have a good rail track, then we put the super fast engine. Okay. So without the poor, we are, what we are having now is a kacha track and we are trying to go super fast. So there is going to be rail accidents. Yeah, that's a nice so. example. So, uh, Dr. Banerjee, thanks a lot. Uh, since we're running out of time, I'll just quickly go back to all our esteemed panelists for one last word on the way forward thing. A minute each, probably, if Dr. Sadib uh, grants that time to me. And, uh, um, and there are a few questions also. Okay, I'll uh, take them quickly, uh, sir. Like uh, the first question, uh, can COVID infected patient get vaccinated? If uh, mm -hmm. yes, then how much time? Uh, mm -hmm. um, we have um, uh, right, seen uh, um, uh, very limited time. Uh, so the, uh, this virus is now more than one and a half year old virus. We have generated a lot of evidence. And here we are discussing only science. We are not discussing any government guidelines and in other guidelines. As per the science, a naturally infected per person, after natural infection, that person is really better protected. So natural infection is providing longer duration of protection and better protection. So as per the available evidences, we can say there is no need to vaccinate. Till such time we generate new evidence that um, vaccination after natural infection is um, helping. 
till date we don't have such type of evidence all based on the speculations that um, um, vaccination after natural infection may provide a um, okay. booster just act like a booster dose so all these are based on assumptions we don't have evidence whatever evidence we have uh, global we have a lot of evidence there are a lot of publication more than 100 publications publications now we have and all are proving that um, a natural infection is providing better and longer duration of protection so there is no need Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dr. Rai. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Das Gupta, uh, one last word you would like to have? Well, uh, in very brief, uh, what we haven't really been uh, up to the mark is actually uh, communication. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to be specific, risk communication and community engagement. That's, that's, mm -hmm. been, the, that's been, if I may, the weakest link from mm -hmm. the very beginning for a disease uh, for which uh, intervention, the, at least the mainstay of intervention is still behavioral. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no definite treatment. The vaccine is still unfolding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's a long journey uh, with the vaccine mm -hmm. and therefore the, the, the relevance and the importance of risk communication mm -hmm. will remain for a whole lot of foreseeable time. And that's something on which we need to do a lot better. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Dr. Banerjee, uh, one last closing. Uh, just to take it one step further on communication, good communication mm -hmm. between uh, great science comes out of great mm -hmm. disagreement. So good scientific mm -hmm. debate rather than uh, suppression of alternative views, so which is mm -hmm. becoming quite a uh, mm -hmm. uh, trend nowadays. So I would say mm -hmm. better debate, scientific debate, transparency, openness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee, just one last question, which came out in one of the discussions with you earlier also. So we also see a lot of conflict between uh, established organizations, like what sometimes guidelines brought in or message given by Ministry of Health, sometimes uh, certain guidelines or message given by World Health Organization. So this conflict, so what is your view on that? Does, that how I, 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 I would reserve my views on that. I don't want this YouTube to get censored. So <laughs> 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 that's what happening. So you get the message. <laughs> okay. okay. Some words are unsaid and you get the message. <laughs> yeah, uh, Dr. Banerjee, thanks a lot. Uh, this communication point is very important. And I, I'm reminded of a recent uh, conference by WHO on science communication, which was just held, I think, uh, a few uh, days back only. And it talks about it talked about communicating scientific uh, uncertainty in these times, actually. And two of the points the, the speakers, eminent speakers there made was that uh, we need to have honest communication of uncertainty which will take people's, uh, which will get people's trust. And we need to have dialogue with local communities so that, you know, the, uh, there's a buy-in by the local community of the communication, which keeps on changing as it's an evolving kind of a situation. So th those are important areas. Uh, uh, at this time, uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, eminent panelists. Uh, uh, Dr. Sudeep, uh, should we take yeah, a few thank questions? You, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, Mr. Tikku. Thank you, really, many, many thanks. Uh, we you. are recording. We we record this session for two purposes. One is we bring out a session video, uh, post the session, and uh, which is widely circulated on the social media and through our post e newsletter, which comes out of the uh, after the summit. And then we also do a press release, which widely goes and it is very much awaited in the media and very widely covered across the country. 